Okay. I don't know if the slides that I prepared will be able to be shown, but no problem if, uh, if not. There we go. Okay. So good morning. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to receive this invitation to speak to uh, the European Schoolnet and to share some thoughts about uh, digital skills. And also in this fantastic city uh, where debates about the place and role of technology uh, for both life and education have always been vibrant. I'm going to share some initial ideas. I hope you will find them interesting. I've decided to do this with very few slides or other visual aids and hope the color, so to speak, is in the words. Before I begin, a bit of background about me. For the past 12 years, I have studied and written about educational technologies for UNESCO. I currently work in a wing of the organization that functions a bit like a think tank. We lead research and produce writing that tries to shine light on the digital futures of education and help UNESCO's member countries steer the digital transformation of education in humanistic, just, and equitable directions. Um, some of you may have seen a book that we uh, just produced. This is about the EdTech experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, entitled An EdTech Tragedy, with the question mark. Um, some of what I will say today stems from this multi-year analysis. And please know that despite the title of the book and a personal viewpoint I hold that is often critical in seeking more from technology for education and society at large, I am, and UNESCO is, enthusiastic about new technologies to help us achieve a better future. So what I've prepared here today is a speech. Um, it should consume about half of our time together, and then I hope we have a chance for more sort of interaction and exchange, comments and reactions. Um, we're stuck here for a full 45 minutes, I have to concede. <laughs> so about half of our time slot, about 25 minutes, uh, will will be consumed with this uh, speech. So not, not a short one, but I hope that you will uh, stick with me. In this speech, I'll cover four main ideas. First, we will look at the relationship between literacy and digital skills, and how digital skills can and should be taught in core disciplines. Second, we will consider the importance of teachers in helping learners develop digital skills and avoiding the temptation to outsource this enterprise to machines. Third, we will examine the importance of helping our youth in Europe and beyond develop critical awareness of digital technologies. We need education systems to show expanded possibilities for the remarkable technologies that are here with us today and those that are still on the horizon, and AI technologies in particular. Fourth, and finally, we will discuss how education systems can shape how and why technology is used. It is not purely a case of technology changing education. It can work in reverse, education helping to change technology and the way we work with technology. So, without further introduction, let's dive in. I want to begin with a simple observation. Literacy has always been foundational to digital skills. We know this. But what we are perhaps not fully appreciating is that this will likely become more true in the future. The technical knowledge that most people think of when they think about digital skills looks poised to become less technical and less niche and more a matter of conversation, of language exchange. We are coming into a world of natural language computing powered by AI. 
In this newly emerging world, we can make digital applications do remarkable things with very little technical knowledge of modern computing. If you'll indulge a thought experiment for a moment, I think it's fair to say that we could probably resurrect any highly literate person from the pre-digital past and plop him or her in front of chat GPT. After a few minutes, this person, utterly unaware of modern technology and without what we would traditionally call digital skills, would be moving with relative ease. The mouse and keyboard would probably cause some early barriers, but you get my point. In just a short time, this person would be unlocking powerful insights about the strengths and limitations, promises and dangers of this remarkable new AI tool, just as we are all doing. What is remarkable about ChatGPT's interface, at least to me, is how sparse it is. It's just your words and its words, an age-old form of correspondence that would be recognizable to Aristotle or Benjamin Franklin, apart from its speed, its instantness. I'm not prepared to suggest that natural language systems will render all or even most technical skills irrelevant, but they will remove many of them as hard barriers. People with limited knowledge of operating systems, drives, menus, file sharing, and so forth, our resurrected Ben Franklin, will have an entry point to tap the power of digital machines and use them to create. The laundry list of technical terms we now park under words and phrases like digital literacy may become more and more the province of specialists, knowledge for builders, but not necessarily for users. So what does this mean for education? It means literacy matters. Now I want to, ar now I want to argue that the many sub-branches we have affixed to literacy, such as media literacy, information literacy, computer literacy, and now AI literacy. While these are important, what we should be most concerned about is the main trunk, capital L literacy, reading and writing, dexterity and agility with both. Since the explosive growth of large language model generative AI applications, I have been surprised to hear a lot of commentary suggesting that the end of writing is near. I have read predictions that composition classes, which are a staple of curriculums in most countries and at almost every level of education, from grade school through graduate level education, may be gradually phased out. Who needs to know how to write when a machine can write for you, these pundits argue. But what is missing in this claim is that for machines to write anything worth reading, you have to write with it. Before I started my career in the UN, I studied composition, both the art of writing and the art of teaching writing. I didn't know it at the time, but this education has been exceptionally helpful as I work with applications like ChatGPT. My background in thinking about writing, talking about writing, and of course writing different types of compositions for different audiences has helped me become, if you'll excuse a bit of presumption, something of a power user with ChatGPT. I can coax, cajole, and coerce the system into giving me more than the middle of the road, put me to sleep, nothing new here writing, which is the application's baseline style of composition. My experience collaborating with other human writers and working with students to help them improve their writing has given me skills and competencies needed to bend these new AI tools to my specific needs and objectives. Vitally, it has also taught me when to toss these AI tools aside and create without them. So in retrospect, I did more to acquire the skills that underlie this new digital competency in classes with names like freshman composition 
than I did in classes with names like Introduction to Computer Systems. What we call digital skills has always been and always will be a moving target. I think it's fair to say that this target is moving faster than it has in the past. Students must cultivate abilities and gain new skills to use ever-changing technology. The basis of this ability is simple. It's strong reading comprehension skills and clear, articulate writing. Given the unrelenting pace of digital change, it is hazardous, I want to argue, to construct disciplines or subjects around digital skills exclusively, especially for young students. An example will help illustrate this point. In the early 2010s, I sat through countless meetings at UNESCO where diligent and well-meaning people said that highly specialized training in different computer programming languages should become a central pillar of school curricula. Many argued that this training should start in primary school and that programming classes should be compulsory. The thinking went that programming would give students practical insights into, comp into computational thinking, and more importantly, get these students ready for jobs in the digital economy. These advocates readily acknowledged that to make room for their computer programming classes, other classes would have to be pushed aside. Interestingly, one of the classes most readily suggested for the chopping, cho chopping block was anything to do with linguistics. Well, fast forward 10 years to today, and people with training in various branches of linguistic are often in hot demand by AI companies. And ironically, again today, it isn't hard to find people writing obituaries for computer programming and commentary suggesting that the world will need a lot fewer computer programmers than we thought we did just a few years ago. What was once the hot must-have digital skill is no longer as hot as it used to be. Excellent literacy skills, however, do seem to be in hot demand in the tech sector and, as we know, all other sectors. I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal this week which said that professional prompters, people who, do, who are good at prompting generative AI systems to do productive things, are being offered salaries of up to $200,000 per year. The background most of these digital professionals have is, you guessed it, in writing. It's worth noting that what we call digital skills are changing so fast that the UN is finding it extremely hard to measure them, as are various international organizations and national organizations and organizations like European Schoolnet. UNESCO, as many of you may know, is tasked with measuring global and country progress towards achieving SDG4, or the Sustainable Development Goal on Education. For those of you who pay attention to this type of thing, SDG target 4.4.1 is to, and I quote, increase the percent of youth and adults with information and communications technology skills by type of skill. And target 4.4.2 is to, again quote, increase the percentage of youth and adults who have achieved at least a minimum level of proficiency in digital literacy. So we set this target in 2015, and UNESCO is tasked with measuring progress against this target. But the UNESCO team that tries to gauge progress towards these targets has called them, understandably, and I quote here, hard to measure, context-specific, and too broad. UNESCO has also highlighted, and again I quote, 
difficulties in identifying suitable indicators and parameters for measuring progress on something as hard to define and quickly shifting as digital skills. The standard that was developed to measure these targets, a framework of nine basic abilities that included things like copy-paste functionality, adding attachments to emails, and using formula and spreadsheets, has already needed to be updated. A number of the skills that were deemed essential when this framework was built in 2015 and 2016 look like they will join abilities such as saving files to a floppy disk in the dustbin of digital history. My point is not that we ignore digital skills. What I want to propose, rather, is that we treat them as skills students will use in core disciplines. They are, as UNESCO has argued, context-specific. Take the context away, and they are meaningless. No one learns the basics of plumbing for fun. We do it because it serves a practical utility. The same holds true for learning how to navigate operating systems, format documents, use cloud storage systems. Digital skills are a means to other ends and rarely ends in themselves. So moving forward, let's stop talking about digital skills as being contained in a new digital discipline, and rather as a package of competencies that's, and not a package of competencies that sits lateral to subjects like reading, math, history, and science, but rather skills that sit within these disciplines. Let's teach the basics of creating and manipulating digital images in science and chemistry. Let's teach the fine points of internet search in subjects like history. Indeed, what could be better preparation for our information-rich and disinformation-dangerous world than learning how to think like a historian, navigating conflicting accounts and stories, corroborating evidence, and looking carefully at sources, and doing all of this with digital tools and the internet as our library. Let's help students become acquainted with spreadsheets and manipulating cells and formulas as part of their mathematics courses. Let's teach the basics of word processing and composition and even literature classes. It is worth noting that the best education I ever received about word processing was a university literature class I took that examined how writing software had changed writing itself. So now, how will this vision of digital skills with literacy and established academic disciplines at the core come to pass? How can we realize this? In a single phrase, it's with teachers. The digital world is and will continue to demand more from teachers, not less. We are intent, though, on pretending it is less, or worse, pretending that the work of teachers can be automated by digital tools themselves. Automation is, in my experience, routinely held up as a solution to teach digital skills. I often encounter people convinced that machines are adept at teaching people about, well, machines. Those automated tours of apps that you have all seen, and operating systems, this, the thinking goes, will do the job. So will AI-guided courses about technology. No human interventions required. It is a dangerous fiction. It is also an affront to humanistic education. For the time being, technology is definitionally amoral. It is unaware of humanity, ethics, values, and everything else that separates us from animals, including language, which machines can still only feign using math and probability, not meaning and knowledge as we do. So introductions to technology and technology tools 
must require human mediators. Entering digital worlds entails entering unfamiliar and largely inhuman worlds. Stepping into the digital is a step full of positive potential, but also we know of hazard and risk. Having human companions watching and helping as these steps are taken, particularly the early ones, is absolutely vital. We have seen the costs of not involving human teachers and human guides in the new uses of technology. Exhibit A is social media. Education systems, teachers, and regulators stood on the sideline as our kids flocked to social media platforms that were fine-tuned for adhesion and even addiction. The negative side effects of this be are becoming blindingly apparent. Isolation, depression, low self-image, polarization, and a sense that the truth floats. We did not understand these technologies, and we let children move into them without guidance. Let us not make the same mistake again. Let's ensure that there are human teachers that are helping our children learn to use technology in empowering ways. Teachers will also be essential to helping build critical awareness about digital technologies. They can help students come to see that the digital worlds we have today are built worlds. There is nothing natural about them. They have been constructed in particular and even peculiar ways, and they could have been constructed differently. This awareness that there is nothing immutable about our digital technology and the logics that steer it is the only way to prepare students to be critical users of technology. And they, and we, must be critical. Presently and far too often, digital skills are defined as learning the ins and outs of proprietary and corporate applications and systems. Yet these applications and systems, it must be stated, are built for one overriding purpose, to churn out a profit for private investors. It sounds radical to say that, but it's true. The singular obligation, the legal obligation, of the technology titans that have built the digital worlds where we spend so much time is only generating financial returns for investors. We have mistakenly, I think, come to define digital skills as working productively in Google's suites, Microsoft's virtual offices, in Meta's universe of addictive apps and neo-metaverses, in Amazon's web services that form a sort of digital substrate for everything we do on the internet, and in X's, anyone can hold a megaphone, Twitter sphere. And if you are in China, in Tencent's walled garden and politically censored WeChat everything app. Young people need to recognize the corporate oligopolies that are the architects of our digital experience. They need to be alert to the motivations of actors in digital spaces and see the ways in which they, as in individuals and members of groups, are part of larger di digital ecosystems and digital economies. Today, connected technologies exert profound influence even on people who may never use them or even see them. I think it's fair to observe that to date, our built digital worlds have very few of what I will call digital commons. If you read the UN literature on digital futures, it is bursting with mention of and enthusiasm for digital commons, loosely defined as public spaces and open resources that are put to use for the public good. But where, I ask you, are the digital commons? 
and what digital technologies I want to know are advancing something that we might, with a straight face, call a public good. And please don't say Google Maps. I can think of one prominent example. Anybody? A, a true digital commons that we have today. We're 30 years into the internet and digital revolution. And I'm speaking to European Schoolnet. Not a single person can name a digital commons. Wikipedia, thank you. That's my example as well. <laughs> it's everybody's example. How many of you have a Wikipedia account? How many of you remember, oh, a couple do, okay. I know who I'm talking to now. Usually no hands go up. <laughs> How many of you remember your Wikipedia password? How many of you hold retirement accounts with big holdings in a stock called Wikipedia? It's remarkable, isn't it? Yet Wikipedia remains a crown jewel of the internet, a testament that our knowledge commons really can be commons free and open for people to use and contribute to, and managed by a community of its users, and not built for the only purpose of having us sit there and look at ads for a long period of time. I wish we could say it's a new innovation, an indication of developments to come. But alas, most people see it as the opposite. It's ancient by digital standards, over 25 years old. And it is also, some will say, a relic of a time when people had higher and more utopian ideals for the internet and its associated technologies. But I see it differently. I see it as a stubborn fixture of our digital present that reminds us and should remind young people that there are alternative ways to connect, to share, and to learn online than the options that are most visibly in front of us today. I am confident that there can be the digital equivalent of parks and rivers and forests that we share, commons that are not scoured for profit, not manipulated into behavior-shaping platforms, nor fenced in and suffocated by governments seeking to assert political and ideological control. Building critical digital awareness will involve, and must involve, helping students see alternative possibilities for technology and helping them exercise digital agency. This is not a political project per se, but one of expansion, creating wider visions for what is possible with technology. Helping people develop critical digital awareness and agency that is anchored in literacy and core, to, and, and, and core to academic disciplines has become even more urgent in our emerging AI world. We are rapidly and with very little public discussion entering a world where knowledge is very often selected, curated, and organized by hegemonic companies. This used to be the task of education systems, but it is increasingly being outsourced to Google and companies like Microsoft and OpenAI. We and our youth need to be clear-eyed about what is occurring. Despite the great promise of technology to both protect and expand our diverse ways of knowing and thinking, it is often doing the opposite in its practical application. The evolution of Google's search engine offers a prime example. Most of you in this room, I imagine, have been using Google for many years, right? In the past, Google proposed a menu of results in response to knowledge queries. In the early iteration, Google would offer about 20 results per page. Very, very few people, it must be said, it's estimated under 5% of people will scroll to the second page. But many users would scroll and study the first page of 20 responses and select the one that they deemed most relevant to their query. As the search engine evolved and incorporated new AI technologies, 
the number of returns on the first page thinned, often to just 10 results, and these results, of course, became personalized. While this, of course, had a convenience factor, it meant that online encounters with diverse, surprising, and new sources of knowledge became less frequent. Today, Google's search engine gives very strong prominence to one search result that it deems to be the most relevant. It is less a menu of options than a forced initial selection. And now, we are migrating to AI chatbots that do away with the menu entirely. They are not responses, they are not results in responses to queries, but one result, a singular response, the response. The technology, if I may, behaves like an oracle. And it will exercise enormous power if we flock to just one or two models for most of our knowledge queries. And this, folks, is the trajectory we are on. We need our children to understand the sweeping social implications that tools like ChatGPT will carry over knowledge if their ascent continues. This is what critical digital awareness and digital agency is all about. People are not mere users. They are active participants in an AI world that is still embryo uh, embryonic and still changeable. They have digital skills, but they also have a wider view of technology and its profound implications for our ways of knowing, thinking, and being. And finally, I want to end on, a, I think, a hopeful note. Too often, we only ask how a new technology will change education and our economies and what skills will be needed. But I think a more interesting question is, how will and how can education shape our reception and steer the integration of new technology, both the technology that is here today and the technology that remains on the horizon. Our education systems can define a trajectory and establish norms for how we understand and use technology, and by extension, how we allow it to influence us, our work, and our world. The central task for education at this moment of inflection with AI is less to incorporate these new and largely untested AI applications to advance against the usual targets for learning. It is instead to help people develop a clear understanding of when, by whom, and for what reasons this new technology should and should not be used. AI is also giving us impetus to re-examine what we do in education, how we do it, and most fundamentally, why. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope we can have a bit of an exchange after this. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, that was inspiring. I think you remember yesterday when we were talking about you know, going from knowledge to skills to competence and starting from knowledge, which is on the what and when, and going to skills, which is about the how, but not stopping there and going to the why, which is on the competence side. And I think the why is what matters at this point. If you, if you don't pose the question why, there's something wrong. And actually, we are stopping posing the question why too often, and especially our uh, students. Uh, I'm afraid that is also the responsibility of the school system, which is very much based sometimes, and maybe too often, on the what and on the how. Well, OK, I, th I think we all agree. That's good, so we can go home. OK, let's go to questions. And I think there will be some questions. There will be some questions, will they? <laughs> so what can we do? I mean, uh, you, 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 you gave us some suggestions. I mean, the critical agency is one of the most important ones. Uh, 
And by the way, one of the examples of comments, I was thinking of news groups. Remember the news groups in the past? You used yeah, the news groups? Yeah, I do remember those. Yeah, and they were still cool. Actually, they're not uh, fancy any longer because everything is on social media. But those were where the, the, the real exchanges. It was not kind of driven by a company, but they were just... Uh, all yeah, times a community group. Yeah, we, we're I both remember. seventeen, are we? <laughs> so, uh, so what can we do? I mean, is if it's a question of, I mean, let's assume policies should do this, but if they don't, how? What power do we have as citizens, as human beings, as users? Yeah, I, I really do think it goes back to what uh, what I was talking about at the, the beginning of the speech, which is it's all about building powerful literacy skills. People who can read and write powerfully, they are curious people and they understand the implications of these technologies. We have a lot of people globally and here in Europe who are what we're beginning to see as sort of proto-literate, even people who are in higher education. I used to work as a university teacher in California before joining the UN. And we would have college students, I mean, and they had, they had trouble reading. They had trouble writing. I see the same thing here in Europe. Yep. We are not, I mean, not to put a lot of weight on, on the PISA scores that just came out, but we are seeing that 15-year-olds around the world have real problems reading, writing, and doing, doing the basics. Yet here we are sort of talking about, again, you know, computer literacy, AI literacy, uh, you know, media and information literacy. It's not, it's not to dismiss these, these branches, but we're often taking our eye off of the trunk. If the trunk is not strong, the branches by definition cannot be strong. So if we really want to help people build digital skills, they need to be strong readers, they need to be strong writers. And I bet if you're honest with yourself how many of you have learned the sort of technical competencies that we call digital skills, I bet a lot of you have learned those just through reading and writing, often on your own, but often with the teacher. And the second point is, as we said in the speech, is teachers can accompany st students through this process and sort of be at their side as they come in to use these different uh, platforms. You know, so often it's just, Go do this on your own. Go sign up for a Google account. I mean, we tell students in public schools to go do this. Not helping them understand all the implications there are when one signs up for a Google account. There, you know, there's a lot of things. And so having a teacher at your side, as I mentioned, a human being who can help you with that process, I think is really crucial. If the teacher is able to, because that is a problem. You know, teachers sometimes are actually the ones who are publishing pictures of their kids on, on <laughs> Facebook and say, well, why shouldn't I do this? Uh, there's a long way to go, but we are working on this. More questions? Uh, that was a euphemism. Yes, please. I will, have a, I will ask a question myself. So, uh, good morning. Um, you have claimed in your speech that we should really focus on the basic literacy, uh, yet so much of the debate is shaped by organizations such as well, UNESCO and the UN and OECD, which are the big organizations in this field. And there is a huge push for other kinds of um, elements. So uh, artificial intelligence, there is the new guidelines on using artificial intelligence. And I believe that your organization and organizations such as ours as well really drive also what the ministries are doing in the field, what the teachers are trying to do. So it's always chasing the next big thing somehow. Um, so do you think that perhaps we should also sit back, reflect a bit more, and see how we uh, engage into this conversation? And instead of trying to, you know, try to develop new guidelines for new things all the time, instead we should perhaps see why are we doing that and what is the important thing? Because if I'm wrong, correct me, but I don't think there is any big um, work at UNESCO developing literacy guidelines, or at European School Net either, literacy guidelines for basic literacy right now, right? Yeah. No, th thanks a lot for the comments and the question. I mean, I think you've, you've, you've said it very clearly. And indeed, maybe we do bear some responsibility for sort of taking the focus off of these 
core literacy skills and simply sort of chasing after the new thing. There is a temptation to do that. To put it very frankly, we don't need new guidelines on how to teach core literacy skills. We know how to do this. It's not rocket science. We've been doing it for thousands of years. It requires investment. It requires good schools. It requires well-resourced schools. It requires fairly paid teachers. It requires opportunities for teachers to get professional development. Some countries are able to do this and you know achieve close to 100% literacy, but around the world we see massive gaps. The number that UNESCO, and I think to UNESCO's credit, is always going back to is the number of illiterate people in the world, which is over 700 million today. That is the real issue and the real problem that demands attention. It was interesting. Yesterday, I participated, and we held a press conference at UNESCO on AI and the sort of future of AI. We had quite a lot of journalists there, and I participated in this. And we were getting sort of que a lot of questions and about you know investments in education and also investments in AI, and it struck me that in an AI world we toss around terms like teaching, learning, coaching, training. In the past, we could be sure that those words concerned human beings and human development. Today, it's not so sure. We spend tens of billions of dollars in public money educating, training, and teaching machines. I'm excited about machines that can read and write. I'm a lot more excited about people that can read and write. And we are going to have to balance these decisions going forward. Thank you. OK, one more question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> one and a half. Uh, um, I would like to ask a question when you were talking about uh, that basically you were talking about using digital tools uh, but going back to the basic reading and writing literacy, um, um, taking the digital tools into the context, right? And I fully agree with that. So one of the things I think uh, I would like to know more is about this cultural context. In the modern words that you said, basically we can name the big text. Let's like say all the digital tools somehow connected to very small number of companies, uh, which they created this kind of uh, digital environment uh, uh, kind of taking the cultural diversity uh, away. So moving forward, how do we look at the cultural diversity when you're talking about the basic literacies uh, uh, using digital tools? Yeah, th th thank you for the question. I, I think to respond, I mean, I mean it when I say I think we can embed building digital skills and competencies in, in, in the core disciplines. My, my own sort of academic training is in history, and I focused a lot on the, the teaching and learning of history. And we were super excited about history and the relevance of history to the sort of digital world that has been unfolding. As, as I mentioned in my speech, really learning about history and learning how to think like a historian is very strong training for our information-rich world. Think of what historians have to do. You have to look at something like the French Revolution and decide what happened. There are lots of different accounts and conflicting accounts, and these people said this, and these people said this, and you have to come to some sort of version of the truth. That is a very powerful skill in our world today with information and disinformation flying around. This is my sort of discipline in my subject, but I'm sure that if we pulled a, a, a chemist up here or we pulled up a mathematician, they would also explain how their disciplines can become a powerful sort of nexus of learning about sp certain digital skills and building certain digital competencies. And that's where I think we need to sort of rethink, you know, what's happening inside of these disciplines to help build digital schools. Now, in response to your question about what do we do about this sort of internet just being fragmented 
into these kind of corporate spaces and, and corporate ecosystems that frankly define our entire digital world now. I think it's useful to sometimes try to draw an analogy between what's happening in digital worlds and what our sort of offline world looks like. And I think the way to look at that, or one way that I've tried to look at it, is to imagine, it's like to imagine a world with no small businesses. I live in Paris. There are thousands of small businesses in my neighborhood and little cheese shops and wine shops. It's fantastic. They're run by families and this and that. There is no equivalent of that in, di in the digital world. It would be like the only thing in the digital world is McDonald's and Walmart and, you know, I don't know what else. You know, and that's it. And that is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Is this the digital world we want? Is that the digital future we want? We saw when the internet was getting going, it didn't look like that. We had a lot more examples of what we would call digital commons, the Wikipedias and other things. We were sharing about news groups and other things. We can remember a sort of different direction and different trajectory we were heading in. I think that is largely a question of governance. It's a question of incentives. But it's also a question about what we do. And I think, frankly, a lot of us have just gotten too used to not paying for digital services and just you know, hoping that these companies do the right thing. I don't mean to call out another company, but I imagine that most of you I have an issue right now, I sound like my mother, I have an issue right now with my phone. WhatsApp now, for whatever reason, I have no idea why, it's putting my messages out of chronology. So I get a message from somebody from work, somebody, a friend, and it shoots it back into 2022 or you know, a, month, a month before, a month after. I have sent, I'm not joking, 25 messages to WhatsApp sort of trying to get them to fix this issue. And I feel like I'm pleading. Because it's a free service, right? I'm not paying for it. So it's like, could you please maybe fix this thing? And at the same time, I'm saying, I 1,000% depend on this for so many tasks. If for work, for personal reasons, like I have become dependent on WhatsApp. And when it's not working, it's literally causing my hair to fall out. <laughs> and I can't get them to fix it because they don't need to answer to me. I'm getting like automated replies from bots and saying, thanks a lot, we fixed your issue. And I'm saying, no, you didn't fix the issue and there's nobody to call and I'm stuck. And this is the trade-off, you know, with free service. Like, where are the services that I can pay for? I'd be happy to pay for a service like that where I can pick up the phone and call somebody. I know I'm sort of diving into the weeds here, but the point is I think we all are a little bit complicit. We have just come to sort of expect that you know, this innovation and services will come for free. They won't come for free. There is, of course, a cost. But I, there's, so there's a governance aspect. There's a, there's a user sort of aspect. And there's our sort of expectations on, on this. Thanks. Last question. Thank you. Last question. Who wants to ask a question? Does anyone? Hello. Can you, can you hear me? I can. Thanks. Great. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. It perhaps seems to me, anyway, there's a the, um, elephant in the room around the digital commons, um, Wikipedia. For decades, teachers have been telling, and there's an irony here, the teachers have been telling students to ignore Wikipedia as a useless source, <laughs> not to be trusted, where perhaps Wikipedia is the only authentic thing left there. So shouldn't teachers recalibrate immediately? Well, how, I, how do we handle that? <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 I heed your call to encourage teachers to have students use Wikipedia and par partially for this idea of building, you know, critical digital uh, agency and, liter and literacy where you see Wikipedia. I mean, I'm trying to imagine a sort of teenager today. You see Wikipedia and you go, oh my gosh, this is super old. This is my parents' internet. You know, what's going on here? <laughs> but is as you come to use it and you, you know, get over the sort of you know, early 2000s user interface, you go, wow, there's something really cool here happening. There's you know, th this information, it just gives me what I need and I can leave. It's not showing me a stream of content that it thinks related to me. It's giving me agency to sort of do the search. It's not feeding me a sort of information flow of things that will keep me there. 
I think this concept of adhesion that I mentioned and is really explained in, in great length in this sort of book is, is very powerful. It is the organizing concept. If you build digital services today, that's the name of the game, adhesion, getting people to be on your platform for as long as possible so you can show them ads. It's really sad when we're honest. I mean, that is, a, that is we have to admit that's, that we should expect more from ourselves. Um, so yes, I think pointing people to alternatives and to examples and showing them that this is not it. The other question we should ask ourselves is where are the the public comments, for instance, with past technologies, radio. There were huge concerns about misinformation, disinformation, you know, giving kind of crazy people a, a megaphone. And the, the, this conversation that we're having today is, in fact, 100 years old. It happened again with sort of television and other things. What was a solution that was, was, was uh, governments came up with? It was public radio. If you look at the mission of something like the BBC, which was the first public broadcasting company, the, the mission is to educate, to inform, and to entertain. And they understood that to harness this new technology, you had to work with it. And they did work with it in a kind of public way and to advance something that I would call the public good. Where are the BBCs of the internet? Well, also the real BBC lately is kind of shaking. Yeah, so that's that's true. That's uh, true. It's changed. That's. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I could continue the whole day. I mean, honestly. And last comment from me. I'm sorry for this because it's been. I mean, uh, I have a problem with scrolling. I mean, this is becoming a real thing. I mean, we're getting lazier and lazier because we are fed with the information that we just scroll. And it's actually addictive. I mean, I say, I'm the first one to say, I, sh I shouldn't do this. <laughs> then I go to Instagram, I say, okay, I, 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 you know. And uh, there must be something in, 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 in the brain. I mean, but God, I mean, we're getting to scroll on, on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter or whatever it's called now. On, it's just, they're giving us stuff. Yeah. They don't even need to go into select one. Like even, I mean, Google is, but there you at least have the, maybe you, can pretend to choose one. They don't. Just scroll one after the other. And that is, for me, is really becoming. Yeah. Can we can we ban, uh, <laughs> abolish scrolling? Like, I, I think we. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're. I mean, you, you're alert to to the adhesion and the sort of addiction. You know, these companies now employ the kind of top behavioral scientists and everything else. There's, you know, there is an incredible amount of science behind what's in those scrolls and how they keep you just so hooked. I mean, in one way, it, it's not an exaggeration to say it's kind of my mind versus, you know, the top scientists in the world trying to understand how to manipulate me and my behavior. It's, it's very problematic. Um, and, you know, we're adults. We're yeah, not yeah. talking about teenagers and yeah. sort of children. So I do think that there has been, I think, a lot of soul searching in governments and recognition that they dropped the ball with social media and that they did not pay attention. And I think that's why we're seeing a little bit more of a kind of proactive approach mm -hmm. to thinking about AI and possible regulations around AI because they don't want to repeat the same mistakes that were made with social media, particularly um, as it concerns children, but how you you know how you regulate these sort of very established uh, companies? You know the tech sector is now you know one of the biggest sectors of the entire economy. So we have very established interests that exist today. But I agree completely that, that the the scrolling and all of this. But how do we help students build a critical awareness of this? And so many of our students today are simply unaware of the way that these uh, platforms and applications are, are, man are frankly manipulating them. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, indeed. Thank that you. That was good. Thank you so much. Okay. <clears throat>